And this is the goal of religion. This is the goal of religion. Ultimately, the goal of God's providence is to bring back this original world. So uh, let's pray that soon God can reestablish uh, his original ideal. Thank you very much, and God bless you. I'm, I'm Herbert Richardson, and I'm a professor of uh, theology uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, I was trained at Harvard and taught there for a number of years and have been very interested in uh, both international and ecumenical theology. I've taught in uh, France and in Germany and uh, been in Japan and Korea. These are some of the reasons why I'm so interested in the Unification Church. Though the Unification Church uh, is new to America, and though in fact we may even say that Reverend Moon is, is, uh, has founded a new movement in 1954, the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity Comes, Yet, the, the remarkable thing about the Unification Church, it seems to me, is not, that, is not its newness. It's, in, it's institutionally new, and uh, people become aware of it, newly aware of it. But at the heart of unification teaching is the, the strong reaffirmation and creative recombination of uh, those teachings that are central to the Bible, and uh, that have been reiterated again and again in the Christian tradition. In fact, uh, the Unification Church is an authentically Christian, uh, powerfully Christian, and creatively Christian uh, 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 church. And not only Christian, but if one wants to say where the real newness of the uh, Unification Church comes from, it's in the fact that it's even older than uh, the other Christian churches in the sense that it has more powerfully and unequivocally than any Christian church uh, related uh, Christianity to Judaism. And I said it at that time, and I would say it again, that, that uh, Reverend Moon's theology, the divine principle, is, uh, in, in my judgment, the most, um, uh, the most uh, creative and the most comprehensive and the most significant uh, theological statement uh, in, the, in the 20th century. I was uh, thinking as you were discussing the creation that, uh, that we might focus a bit more on that topic and uh, um, say turn to the question of say what specifically uh, was God's purpose in creation? And I think here the Unification Church uh, has some very interesting things to say, things that are in many respects consistent with, with other uh, uh, theological traditions, in their emphasis on what they often call the three blessings, the notion that, that man was created to grow to maturity in terms of his or her relationship with God as a preparation for moving into yet another stage in the unfolding of life, uh, marriage and, and uh, the raising of children. And, uh, and, and yet that's not the end. Uh, of God's uh, purpose in creation, but it's also to, as they say, to build the kingdom of God on earth. So you have this kind of interesting progression uh, as uh, uh, in, in unification, doctrine of creation, and this kind of concretization of, of what, what it is that God is wanting to do, and centered, as it is, as, as you well know, on, on, on the notion of marriage and family. You know, on the doctrine of creation, the uh, thing that fascinated me there is uh, how consequential Moon is in stating very, very strongly that, uh, that the image of God in man is precisely uh, human fatherhood and motherhood. We talk about God our Father in Christian theology, but then we talk about the Imago Dei. We don't talk about the role of being a father and being a mother as the very act in which human beings express God-likeness. It's, um, we tend to talk about human rationality, human creativity. But in unification theology, it's there's the linking of this Christian notion of God as Father, right in the doctrine of the Trinity, 
with the Imago Dei and saying human parenthood. Mm -hmm. That's where the Imago Dei is found. Mm -hmm. I think what's strong about unification, though, is, is that it doesn't simply have a set of secular relationships. It does have that, but it also has a set of theological relationships between uh, groups of families. They now talk about trinities in, in family, trinity relationships in family. And I find that reinforcing. I think if you, the extended family notion, if it's kept purely on a social, strictly social dimension, I think it's going to tend to well, disintegrate. I, I, I like it. I it's going to disintegrate. Well, I, I personally, uh, I'm not all that thrilled with the extended family. I, uh, uh, I find the, uh, obviously, if one can be convinced that there are at least three parties to every marriage, the husband, the wife, and God, then you have a cement which is very, very profound. I think in our secular culture this was lost. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons why I um, look sympathetically on what the Unification Church is attempting to do is because they were attempting to find the cement. In the Unification theology, there's the belief that um, when God created Adam and Eve, and here we're talking about when God creates anyone, you or me, when God created Adam and Eve, they were created as basically children, babies, just as we're born as children and babies. And that the task for human life that actually God intended for Adam and Eve and that God intends for each of us is that we, that we develop both physically and spiritually and that we go through the stage in the life process of moving from childlike uh, dependence and learning through imitation and receiving love to the stage of uh, young adulthood where we share love and uh, and uh, then where we become parents and can give love to children. And when we become parents and give love to children, then we become like God, who is our heavenly parent who gives love to us. Now, the interesting thing about this, it's a, it's a process, it's the human process is the process of divinization or becoming like God. But the critical thing that's so different from much Western Christianity is that the key unit is the idea of the family. Because here, this whole process goes on between children and parents, parents and children, mm -hmm. husband and wife. So, so uh, what uh, is crucial in unification theology is not just talking about the importance of the family, but talking about the need to create a new form of family. That is to restore the family or redeem it from those factors that make it uh, an uncaring institution because parents haven't yet learned the capacity for parental love. An institution where people experience betrayal uh, and rejection because people haven't yet learned fidelity. Uh, an institution which is privatistic and selfish because people haven't yet learned how to see their families as part of a larger spiritual family so that they don't have to leave all their friends when they marry. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing within unification uh, religion is this, is this teaching that uh, marriage is for grown-ups. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't That's marry right. in order to grow up, uh, but you only, and of course the unification church suggests a proper age to marry, and you're not mm -hmm. old enough to marry until first you've become mature, and part of the way you demonstrate the maturity is you have exercised responsibility, parental type responsibility, toward others, what are called your spiritual children. You know, and we, ha we have not only a doctrine, but as you're suggesting here in these comments, you also have a set series of practices, mm -hmm. a kind of rule, a, a way of life within the Unification Church that is centered around these kinds of issues. So yeah. after they've had the experience of, of raising up other people spiritually, mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, prepares them then for marriage. And, and well, then there's marriage and even a third stage beyond marriage so that marriage doesn't become sort of the be and end all of life, but it becomes the context out of which a more uh, just and full society might emerge. The context of parenthood. We, you know, in, in unification theology, people marry to become parents. Mm -hmm. The church, it seems to me, needs a link between what Jesus has done the model of love that he gives us, it's the peerless model, I think, mm -hmm. I mean, I think, 
But how do we institutionalize that? And, and I think that in a sense what Reverend Moon is trying to do is to give us a way of seeing what a, what a Christ-inspired family could be in the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. everybody. You all look bright and happy. What are we going to talk about today is also a very interesting topic, and that is the character or personality of Jesus. This is probably one of the most mysterious or unknown aspects of Jesus. What was his real personality like? And actually, historically, we've had a very difficult time to try to uncover the real personality of Jesus. One problem is we know that Jesus is different than us because he's divine. He's divine. Last week, we explained the nature of Jesus' divinity. Centering on God, Jesus' spirit and body are perfectly harmonized perfectly harmonized. So therefore, Jesus is the embodiment of God. Not God himself, but the embodiment. Jesus' relationship with God is a relationship of oneness, indivisible, because Jesus is existing by the same principle that God is existing. So the oneness of spirit and body. So we could say that Jesus is the first one who harmonized uh, spirituality and humanity. Here is the first individual centering on God that could harmonize his spiritual side, his spirituality, with his physical side, his, his humanity. And uh, the result of this is the perfect personality of Jesus, or his divine nature. But this has been so hard to understand for all of us. Do you know why? Because none of us are like that at all. As a matter of fact, our historical experience in regards to the relationship of our spirituality and our humanity is that they contradict, don't they? If uh, we looked at ourselves, centering on God, our spirit and our body are at war with each other, aren't they? All you have to do is to try to, uh, try to live a spiritual life. Try to live a spiritual life. And the, the first thing you'll confront is that your body doesn't want to go along. <laughs> your body doesn't want to go along. St. Paul described it very clearly. He said in the uh, seventh chapter of Romans, I, uh, the 23rd verse, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my spirit, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of death? So here we can see that St. Paul was lamenting over this historical dilemma that you and I have such a hard time with the relationship of our spirit and body, that actually our body is working against our spirit. So we make the mistake of uh, projecting the same kind of situation on Jesus. 
So in other words, we try to understand or conceive of Jesus by denying his humanity and then uh, focusing more on the divine side, making him uh, seem so ethereal and otherworldly. And this is how we usually conceive of Jesus. And any uh, movie that you've ever seen uh, about Jesus, usually the way Jesus is portrayed is like that, isn't it? For instance, he only speaks in symbols and parables, right? He only speaks in symbols and parables, and he walks three feet off the ground, and he usually has this very soft, ethereal, otherworldly kind of voice. And uh, usually they uh, hire somebody to play Jesus who has that very far away look. Or maybe you've seen paintings of Jesus where he looks so thin and pale and has the flowing brown hair. But do you think the real Jesus was like that? As a matter of fact, the real Jesus was completely the opposite. Completely the opposite. Do you think that the real Jesus just spoke in symbols and parables? What if you were his disciples? And uh, this, uh, your leader only spoke in symbols and parables. Wouldn't you get frustrated with him? Can't you say hello? How was your day? Anything. But the Jesus we see in the movies is just speaking in symbols and parables. Consider the lilies of the field. Oh, no. Here comes another parable. <laughs> okay, another parable. But actually, the real Jesus we can see, according to the scripture, was so different than that. First of all, what was the, his uh, profession? He was a carpenter. If uh, he was a carpenter, then he would have to be a pretty strong guy. Far from being this sort of skinny and uh, pale person with the long flowing hair, the real Jesus must have been really strong. Back in those days, they didn't have power tools either. Mm -hmm. you know, if you were a carpenter, you had to do all the, uh, all the lifting, everything. It was such hard work. I can imagine that the real Jesus must have had really big arms and big hands. He was a laborer. He was a laborer. Uh, also, the, the Bible indicates that Jesus was a very powerful person. When he would speak, everybody could hear. He spoke uh, on the Sermon of the, on the Mount to thousands of people, and everybody could hear. Even in the back row, they could hear. Now, I know how hard it is to speak a lot. To get your voice to go into the back row, it's hard. It strains your voice. And Jesus didn't have a PA system. He didn't have a microphone. But everybody could hear. Everybody could hear his speech. That means he must have had a really strong, booming voice, don't you think? Everybody could hear. Jesus wasn't this... Uh, you know, pastoral, kind of skinny guy. He was really a strong, even in a righteous way, ferocious person, full of life, full of energy, full of zeal. And I think of one story that really illustrates this best. <laughs> and that is when Jesus cleared out the temple. That is so revealing. And uh, I've read uh, different uh, Bible interpretations and uh, uh, the way that that scene is interpreted many times is, well, see, even the Lord can uh, lose his temper and get upset. Shame, shame on the Lord. He got upset. But what was the real situation there? The Bible tells us Jesus walked in the temple and he saw that they had made the temple, the house of God, into a shopping mall. And he was so angry. Not for himself. It wasn't an act of selfishness. He was angry for God. That God's house would be turned into a shopping mall. And the Bible tells us that Jesus went out and he came back with a weapon. He didn't go in there unarmed. He came back with a weapon. He had a whip. And the Bible tells us that Jesus made the whip himself. Now, you can believe a man that knows how to make a whip knows how to use it. And he knows exactly where to put it. 
And he went walking to that temple. And the Bible tells us that he didn't just uh, speak a parable, but he cracked that whip. He turned over the tables. And not only that, he even grabbed the merchant's money and just dumped it out on the floor. And the most revealing thing about this is not one merchant stood up to Jesus. Not one of them. They were too busy crawling all over themselves trying to get out of the temple. Well, that reveals a lot about how Jesus was, one aspect of his character. In other words, he goes in there cracking that whip, turning over them tables, grabbing the money. There was no question in their mind that this man is going to kill us if we don't get out of here. Righteous and fearless. That was one side of Jesus' character. Far from the, uh, the, the image of Jesus that we see uh, uh, in the movies where he's just speaking in symbols and parables, the real Jesus was righteous and strong and powerful. Yet this same Jesus, in the next minute, could wander into the wilderness, could sit in the pasture, and could consider the lily. The same man that could clear out the temple could consider the lily. How amazing. Jesus' personality was all-encompassing. On one side, he was a, a, like a righteous lion, so strong and ferocious. But in the next minute, he could be so tender and sensitive that he could consider a lily or observe the birds of the air and learn such a uh, sensitive message about the kingdom of God. You know, one of the most beautiful parables in the Bible is the one about considering the lilies of the field. Beautiful parable, so sensitive. Yet the same Jesus that could consider a lily in the next minute could go down to the docks and rub elbows with the fishermen. Jesus was the friend of the fishermen. And the reason he was the friend of the fishermen is not because they heard some uh, glorious music, Hosanna, when he showed up. You know, in the movie, one of the movies I saw, Jesus goes down to the dock and he comes up to Peter and he says, Peter, come, I will make you a fisherman of man. And the music is in the background. Oh, you know, so glorious like that. But do you think the real Jesus was like that? Do you think he had that kind of glorious music all the time playing? <laughs> and people just automatically could see his aura and, oh, you must be the Messiah. <laughs> Not at all. The real Jesus was the friend of the fishermen because he could outfish them. And that's the only way you can get a fisherman to respect you, is if you can fish better than they can. And the Bible shows us that Jesus went down there on a bad day. They were having a bad day. They were on the shore cleaning their nets. And he showed them where to catch fish. You show a fisherman how to catch fish, and he'll respect you. He'll become your friend. So this same man that could uh, uh, be sensitive to the lily could rub elbows with the toughest and roughest fishermen. And this same man that could rub elbows with the toughest and roughest fishermen also knew the tender heart of women. <coughs> he understood more than anyone the tender heart of women. And uh, actually, you know, Jesus' relationship with women was so controversial because he treated them equal <coughs> with men. Jesus was the first one who allowed women into the place of worship equally. Women can hear the word of God equally with man. Well, that was against the tradition. Jesus also uh, created a revolution in terms of uh, men and women, the equality of men and women, when he demonstrated that forgiveness is equal for man and for woman. Very dramatic, famous story. Uh, one woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the religious leaders came and they brought her to Jesus and threw her down at Jesus' feet. They weren't there to really seek Jesus' guidance. They were there to really see what is his stand going to be. Are you going to follow the tradition or not? Because according to the tradition, 
The woman caught in adultery should be stoned. But the man, well, men will be men. The man isn't stoned. He's given some uh, a slap on the wrist. So how unfair this was. And they had rocks in their hands, this irate crowd, and they surrounded Jesus and this woman. And uh, the Bible tells us Jesus was just drawing in the dirt. And they asked him, Jesus, what should we do? Jesus stands up. He says, he among you who is without sin, you cast the first stone. And beginning with the elder, they dropped their stones one by one, and they went away. And Jesus went to the woman and said, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She looked up and she said, No man, Lord. And then he said, Then neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Incredible revolution. Incredible revolution. This man who could rub elbows with the fishermen, who could clear out the temple, understood the heart of women. And that's why if you read the scripture, you can see that the only ones who really demonstrated the heart of devotion and attendance to Jesus while he was on earth were women. Mary Magdalene, she, she washed his feet with her tears and dried, dried his uh, feet with her hair. One woman uh, anointed Jesus' hair with, with oil out of her devotional heart. And what did the apostles say when that was going on? They complained. Why this waste? Where were all the apostles at the foot of the cross? They weren't there. Who was there? It was women. Women were with Jesus at his hour of suffering at the cross. So what an incredible person. What is really the essence of the divinity of Jesus? Not because he could walk on water. Not because he could raise the dead or do miracles. None of those things. Because of his heart. The quality of his heart. And the thing that just made me so angry about all the movies I've ever seen about Jesus, they never showed Jesus as a man of tears. I saw one movie, I believe it was The King of Kings. And in that entire movie, that Jesus didn't even shed one tear. It made me so mad I wanted to knock over the projector. Jesus was a man of tears and compassion. Read the scripture. So many times we see uh, the Bible records Jesus being moved with compassion when he saw the people. Or staying up all night praying in tears. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed in tears so much it was like, the, like drops of blood. His tears were so great. The real essence of the Messiah is divine heart. And Jesus had that divine heart. And we need to understand that essence because Jesus promised that Christ would come again. So what is it that we're looking for? How will we recognize Christ when he comes again? Are we going to look for some external thing? Jesus said it's an adulterous generation that seeks after a visible sign. We won't get a visible sign. We have to recognize the quality of the divine heart of God present within the man who is Christ. That's one reason, unfortunately, Jesus was not recognized 2,000 years ago. They were expecting many external things to take place, but never could understand the essence of his Messiahship was the true parental quality of his heart. Then in this age, this age of history, let us be awake and aware, and let us be ready to be able to recognize that divine quality of heart that will come again. Thank you very much. God bless. The main points of Reverend McCarthy's lecture, The Personality of Jesus, are, first, that he had perfect union of spirit and body. Second, that he lived righteously for the accomplishment of God's will. Third, 
he was compassionate and understanding. And fourth, the essence of his divinity is his heart. So today, the mankind, the primary question is the question of peace. Everybody talk about peace. All nations are talking about peace. But under the circumstances, under the background of history, can we truly achieve that lasting peace? That's the question. <laughs> It is a logically true that when the cause is wrong, the result always wrong. No way you can change the causes by the result. The result is only the reflection of the cause. <laughs> The human history so far has been sown in struggle, war, blood, hatred. Therefore, we can only reap such consequences, such results. Therefore, in order to truly obtain the peace of the world, we have to begin with the new call. We have to saw peace. We have to, we have to have a new field and a fertile land for the peace to start out first. You know, what's the peace? Seed it. Today, this world is filled with hatred. Particularly neighboring nations and neighboring races, neighboring, neighboring people, there are more hatred than love. Everybody's hating each other. That's the con this is the result of the day. <laughs> Individually, so much division and hatred. As the tribal basis, there's so much hatred and division. And the national and the worldwide scale, there's so much confrontation, hatred. <laughs> So if these are the, the results of the present world, we just keep talking about ideal world unless we have to start out again with the new car, new beginning, mark the new beginning, it would not come. The human history has started from the wrong point or wrong side. So we have to restart the human history from the good point, from the, from the truth, not from the lie. Unless we have new movement developed and are truly aiming at the true peace, sowing a true peace on the ground, there shall be no lasting peace. <laughs> If there is truly God, and God is almighty, when he look at this reality, would they, uh, would they be just be contented with the reality? Or would they be put up with the reality? Or he's going to definitely do something about it to change our world into original shape. Then, then if there is someone here on earth commissioned by God to take over his mission, to champion his cause, then that man or that group of people, what would they claim? What would they come up with? What would be their claim? Number one, the one thing is... 
one thing is absolutely clear. The men of God, the men who are commissioned by God to change the course of history, shall claim that the present cause is wrong and error, so you must turn around. They will not say, all right, keep going, what you're doing today. The men of God must say, you must change your course. 180 degrees. Then what would be the, the symbolic slogan for that man then? What the men of God can claim? What do you think? What that, uh, you know, if you are clever, you, you, can, you can figure out what is that slogan should be. It's simple. Simple. Because the world started out with the hatred and the lie. So, 180 degree different attitude, different cause should be what? Love. Love. Absolute love. To the degree to you love even your own enemy. Love your enemy. To me, that slogan is a powerful slogan that can change the course of history. That is like a sailing boat, like a sail, actually. Uh, that can change the course. Love your enemy. Can you find any, any more powerful than this one? Some might think, well, that's the easy answer. Father, you gave me a couple more seconds, I would come up with that slogan, you might think. <laughs> but if you are told what is our slogan, then it seems to be easier, easy answer. But when you are not hearing that, uh, that answer, then it becomes totally in, in darkness, and totally you don't know. In a, and throughout history, all the saints and the great philosophers, they'll be mulling over the question, couldn't find that. <laughs> loving people, particularly loving to the degree to your own enemy, you love someone to a degree so high and noble and supreme, you can even love your enemy. That power, that power can melt everything. That melts everything. God needs such a movement to melt the wrong world and bring it back to the right one. And in order to do that, God initiates such movement in the name of religion. The entire worldwide religious movement, in a different degree, they're pursuing this one slogan, to love your enemy. Then, about the Solomon saints who came upon this, uh, this our earth, our planet, who shall do you think God would love him most? Then, I think that answer is very simple. Because there's someone who said that. Someone who said that. <laughs> There's so many saints in our, in our world, in our history. But among them, the one who stands out like a giant, Jesus Christ. And he actually said it, that you love your enemy. And he indeed, in that capacity, among the saints, all the saints, he shall become the Messiah. He <laughs> The time where Jesus appeared here on earth, there was a great wall was created between one great empire, one small nation of Israel. 
The great empire certainly was the Roman Empire. There was a wall of hatred, wall of power, wall of conquest. One is conqueror, the other is oppressed people. The wall couldn't be any higher than that. And the Jesus knew the only way to conquer Rome is by love. You conquered me, conquered our nation, conquered our people by the power, political power, military power, but I conquer you by my love, love of God. So Jesus declared that Jesus' strategy has been there for the you love the enemy. That was the strategy of Jesus, the principle of Jesus. Even he was crucified. And then Roman soldiers that did this by the peers and the, the, you know, just the piercing his own heart. Still, Jesus can be able to pray, say, God, forgive them, for they do not what they do. That is the principle for eternity. No power can be any greater because with the power of love, no matter whatever the wall and the barrier is high and thick, it can be overcome. It can be break through, broken through. So, Jesus knew that everybody has their own enemy. Individually, individual enemy there is. The family has family enemies. And the tribe has tribal enemies. The nation has nation national enemies. The world has all the confrontation between two different worlds. And Jesus knew. So hatred and an enemy feeling always hit and be hurt each other. The hitting, killing, and the hurting each other all the time. There's so many sacrifices. In an individual level, family level, tribal level, national level, and a worldwide level. But by breaking down this wall of hatred, there's only one method, one principle, one strategy works. Love your enemy. But the enemy world, the fallen world, when they are trying to retribute, when trying to pay back the harm done, they always, by doing revenge, if God and Jesus uses the method of revenge to build his kingdom, there would not be any, even one human being left here on earth. Everybody has been extinguished. What happened? Mm -hmm. Don't you think so? <laughs> So, the restoration of great, uh, great movement come from this new ideology, new ideology of love. Supreme power of love alone can bring out the new a new day, and a new beginning, and a marking new history. <laughs> When you, when, when person has a power, power to love you even your own enemy, that power is supreme. That person is a truly giant. There is nothing that that person cannot embrace with. There's nothing that person can not uh, digest. That person can, you know, can deal with. Therefore, ultimately, that person shall be shall conquer the world in good way, God's way, 
and Christianity is the center of it. So far to see, God sees that as long as the Christian remain here on earth, and the Christians are pursuing this doctrine, the principle, then there shall be the great victory, conquer. <laughs> When you saw the bean seed, bean sprout will come out. When you saw the, the green, green, green bean, the green bean will come out. When you saw the red carnation seed, carnation will be red. That is the nature, that's the principle. Nobody can deny it. When you saw the hatred, the fruit of hatred will come out. When you saw love, then fruit of love indeed will come. <laughs> but the important thing is the size of love, the sizes of that love. There's the small, the pity, and the small peanut love, giant love, universal love. However, the Christianity has been failing this principle. Christianity itself has been failing. Its Christianity has been contradictory to themselves. They should love their own enemies according to the principle, but they could not. That was the major difficulty of the Christianity. The Christianity. They always preaching on a Sunday morning that you love your enemy. But the Jesus also said, you love your neighbor. Who is in the neighbor of the Christianity? Well, another fellow Christian. They're truly loving another fellow Christian. They in a Presbyterian love the Methodist. Methodist love uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness, whatever. Or the, uh, you know, Catholic love the Reunification Church, whatever. What are they doing? Are they doing? <laughs> So, Father always has been harboring the conclusion to the Christian doctrine. It doesn't make a difference whoever say to us that the heretic, whether you are not a Christian or no Christian, it doesn't make a difference. Whoever practice the principle, love your enemy. The more practice, closer to God, the truly orthodox of the Christianity. Yeah. That's the way Father has been leading. <laughs> the law can unite. Christianity, practice love, then we can unite the Christianity. Then the Christianity can unite the religion, unite the world. That's the way it goes. It has to be started with the Christianity itself. Until we have this, achieved this goal, we cannot go on the next.